57 p.m. Yeah, it's 9.47 p.m. here in Barcelona, so yeah, it should be the same. So we are one minute late. We are? Do we? Seems to be. Uh, I mean, I, I took us live, but we're still missing people, and I'm wondering... I think on the calendar, oh, why did I, oh, I must have wrote a typo. I, I thought it was 3.15 Eastern, oh, no, PDT, hmm, 20.15 British Standard Time, summertime, so. I think I think we are live already, so there's uh, people uh, signing in. Okay. I see Lidio de Yala joining us. Hi, Lidio. I think they may have changed the uh, timing. We see more people, so. Um. Yep, there you go. Great. So, for some does it look like um, just us three today? Uh, well. Or the panelists? So, well, we can start with us three, and I think uh, people can join. Yeah, there's a total of 15 people in the room right now. Okay, let's get going. I am just trying to find Okay, let me let me get started by uh Welcoming everyone uh, to our uh, our session, and uh, uh, we have uh, four panelists uh, planned for today. Uh, my name is uh, Usama Fayyad. I'm chairman at Open Insights. I'm also uh, executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University, um, and we we are going to discuss here kind of the emergence of uh, innovation clusters and what kind of governs and helps this. Uh, with me so far are uh, An Wang, who is co-founder of uh, Sofragen Medical in the U.S., and uh, Jordi uh, Raffles, who is the CEO of Innojet uh, in uh, in Spain. So uh, we are expecting a couple of more panelists, but. Uh, we can get started. So perhaps uh, uh, we can start by uh, introducing ourselves, maybe starting with you, An. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, so as mentioned, I am um, the chief technical officer of a commercial state medical device company um, in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, relevant to this panel when we're discussing about supporting innovative cluster I am a faculty at MIT, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and also serve on various advisory group, including the Massachusetts um, Medical Device Organization, Massachusetts Bi Mass Bio Organization, and my hometown, the Salt Lake City Mayor's Advisory Group, uh, where we work to think about building a cluster for economic development. Thank you, and uh, Jordi? Yeah, likewise. Uh, thanks for having me again here. It's always a pleasure to participate at Oasis uh, events. My name is uh, George Raffles, acting as a CEO at InnoGet Company. Uh, InnoGet is a company founded in 2006. Uh, we've been in the market so for more than 70 years, offering uh, free access to an online uh, network, uh, an open innovation network, we call it similar to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, but specifically created to uh, generate and foster cooperation among different stakeholders which are actively involved 
in uh, technology and knowledge transfer from both sides of the process, either from the demand side of the process or the industry basically scouting for partners, technology partners and innovation partners and universities, research centers, any uh, incubators, startups uh, pushing out technologies for commercialization based on uh, our idea to democratize uh, knowledge transfer and innovation. We see a clear need for developing uh, innovation ecosystems and in some uh, 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 cases, and uh, we can catch up on this later on, on trying to redefine the purpose of many organizations, not only looking for shareholder value, but for stakeholder value. And uh, this means that um, uh, since uh, new knowledge is being created uh, much faster than in, uh, in the past, if we look backwards, uh, then uh, 100 years ago, uh, we need to really uh, foster this type of cluster organizations among different regions and also uh, within uh, specific uh, domains uh, of knowledge. Okay, thank you. And in, in way of introduction, I already described my role. Uh, my, my background is mostly in AI and machine learning and making those technologies work. But I have had uh, several roles kind of building uh, innovation ecosystems, especially with technology startup uh, ecosystems, and have been exposed to uh, a lot of these efforts. I'm a, a big believer in the accelerator model. Let me start out by asking our panelists. And by the way, we plan to have uh, an, an interactive session. So by all means, post any questions you have and we'll, we'll uh, reserve enough time to uh, discuss with the audience. But let me, uh, or, or have your questions answered by the panelists. But let me start out by asking each panelist very briefly to say kind of, uh, what do you look for? What are you looking for from today's session? Like what is a the theme you'd like to, to leave today's session with? Yeah, I can get started. Um, so right now, um, one active project I'm working on is helping um, a city in the western U.S., Salt Lake City in Utah, think through how do they prioritize their limited public uh, resources, right, to build an ecosystem. And as a community, they have uh, focused in on life science. But as you can imagine, you, um, Building a, a, an industry where your focus in pharmaceutical is not something you can do overnight and, and something that's heavily um, invested. So what I'm curious to hear is like, you know, how does other cities or organizations think through prioritizing focus? So even though we say cluster, right, so it's a community of, of various stakeholders, but how do you focus um, in what your speciality is. So for an example, in Salt Lake, we're thinking, are we an agriculture life science focus? Are we digital health? Are we pharma, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious to, to think through how does everybody um, triage what to focus on? Great, and you, Jordi? Well, definitely, uh, I would like to know uh, and learn uh, from these topics as well. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to create a debate around this. Uh, you know, uh, on top of uh, the uh, uh, main hub uh, for open innovation, this ecosystem, global ecosystem that we are, have been building for the years, we do also have a, what we call the Innogate Cloud Tool, which is a wide label for different organizations to create and digitalize the knowledge roadmap, the innovation ecosystems. And uh, it's very interesting for us uh, uh, to find ways on how these ecosystems can be um, incentivized, right? Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, it's quite easy to find different uh, tools, different solutions. We have one which has been named by Garner as a cool vendor for R&D for, for manufacturers. So it's a very nice tool. But it's not only about the tool, it's also about how you manage the tool or the purpose of the tool and uh, how do you engage with uh, this community. So I think it's uh, also something that can be connected uh, with what Anne has uh, already mentioned, which is uh, how do you prioritize, how do you manage, how do you uh, uh, engage with these uh, communities uh, named as clusters or uh, ecosystems at the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from from my side, uh, I'm definitely looking to get as many 
questions and participation from the audience as possible as we have our discussion. Uh, secondarily, I am uh, uh, similar to, to you, Ann. I'm involved uh, also in a project uh, called the Rue Institute, which is part of the uh, Uni Northeastern University. Uh, there was a, a grant, a very generous grant from Dave Rue and his wife uh, to kind of uh, create an innovation hub and a new economy, actually, in the city of uh, Portland, Maine, to kind of diversify the economy of that city from, you know, restaurants and, and fishing to new areas, uh, especially areas in, in high tech, in AI, in life sciences, and so forth. So definitely a strong interest and in in an active program trying to figure out how to uh, create that, uh, that ecosystem. So let me uh, uh, start out with uh, a question. Um, let's start with kind of one example that you consider a particularly positive example of effective of an effective innovation cluster. Maybe Ann, you go first. Yeah. So um, recently, I had the privilege of participating in the Berlin Center, their like Chate program, um, where it's a really great collaborations between um, the state or, or, or the city and innovators um, in town and how they decided to build the, the ecosystem. And obviously it's motivated by economic development, right? The more people you can keep locally, the more company you can grow, the better the community and in job creations and, and community building. And what I've learned is that what the city did was invested capital and in into a program where they build they that is focused per, um, on digital health and my understanding is that they focus on digital health because it requires the least amount of of capital uh investment um in order to to uh, make advances within the the healthcare um industry and by investment, the city actually writes a sizable check in, in the millions um, um, range per year for this program to basically cater um, projects through and de-risk those projects, right, by helping with clinical studies, doing market surveys uh, for these technology to make it to market. What's really fascinating about that is if you look at the programs and how it's structured with you know, public and private sectors that you actually see companies and technology coming to, to market um, aided by public um, support. Really fantastic. Okay, wonderful. And uh, we, we have been joined by, uh, I noticed by David. Uh, uh, so, so thank you for, uh, for making it, David. Um, uh, we had already done some introductions and, and started uh, uh, our first uh, our first question. Uh, but uh, just to kind of have you join in, uh, can you start out with um, an introduction of yourself and also what you're looking to get out of this panel? And then I'll come back to you with a question after Jordi answers. Can you hear us? Um, sure. Uh, and I just yeah. wanted to uh, yeah apologize for being a little bit late. Um, and hopefully I'm coming through clearly enough. Yes, you're, you're very clear. So Great. please go um, ahead with your uh, um, introduction. Sure. Um, very briefly, I run an investment firm called Just Business. Uh, we uh, run out of Silicon Valley in California. Um, our primary focus is on renewable energy and the uh, decarbonization of transport. So we have uh, companies that we've invested in that deal with the lithium ion batteries that go into Teslas and soon VWs and Fords and GM. Um, and so we also have two companies in the hydrogen space and a solar company. So really we're looking at how can we create energy both for um, grid systems as well as for uh, transport that no longer need to produce carbon in the transmission of those activities. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, one one uh, in one liner or uh, ten seconds. What what are you looking to get out of this panel? Well, already just in the preparation for it, I met some wonderful people and and had some uh, exchange with them. And so, as many of these things, it's meeting great people who have a good vision for the world and know how to execute. So, um, I'm sure that there are panelists as well as uh, participants that are, that are. Um, you know, super intelligent 
and I can learn a lot. Great. Uh, so, uh, Jordi, over to you with the with the first question, um, which is, let's start with one example you consider particularly positive of kind of the effective formation of an innovation cluster after our her example. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I would I would like to talk about many, but uh, maybe uh, I would like to point out on on. Uh, a type of ecosystem which is uh, quite difficult to handle and to manage, which is a uh, university ecosystems, right? Uh, where there is different types of uh, interest, uh, different type of approaches, and uh, in many uh, uh, cases, there is a lot of potential which is missed along the process and administration and administrative uh, processes, which are uh, really blocking uh, the uh, possibilities for this type of organizations to really uh, extract the maximum value out of the uh, knowledge and the intellectual property that the organization is generating. So uh, in this sense, uh, we uh, uh, spend, we invest, and we were part of a consortium uh, funded by uh, the European Commission. It was a former Horizon 2020 program where we uh, uh, developed, we uh, uh, work around uh, how to uh, better uh, enhance this process of uh, industry academia collaboration and uh, we took uh, a part of uh, building an ecosystem a digital ecosystem uh, that could help the university to really better know what they know and better engage with uh, 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 faculty and uh, by using our uh, tool uh, we, we develop different uh, routes different process processes in order to uh, leverage uh, the capabilities that the university can put in front of uh, the society through either the industry or uh, any other stakeholders uh, directly. In this case, uh, we uh, did several programs uh, by using this uh, methodology and this tool with several universities in Germany, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Spain. And uh, one of our, uh, would say, uh, success uh, uh, and stories and uh, it's a quite a, a new project in that space is with the National Biofilms Innovation Center in the UK where uh, they are using the system in order to enhance uh, community around around this topic and it's really uh, working very well. The community is growing around uh, this concept of open innovation and collaboration by using digital. And David, do you have in mind a particularly good example? Because my next question is going to be also, what would be uh, you know the biggest challenge? But anyway, let's let's go with this one. Well, whenever you're opening up a new market, and I'll I'll refer to right now, say um, the hydrogen. Uh, there's a lot of chatter around the world about hydrogen as the new energy source. Um, you know, clean burning. Um, and plentiful, uh, you know, wherever there's water and wherever there is, um, you know, uh, really clean access to uh, natural elements, we can get, we can bring hydrogen. The challenge is um, uh, developing out an ecosystem where it's viable to deploy hydrogen. So um, let's say uh, working in Europe, there's a lot of compliance pressure from governments to uh, um, uh, legislate the need to reduce carbon in transport, whether in trucks or buses or whatever uh, agricultural equipment. So that compliance from the government then puts the companies in a place where they need to find a solution. Where that doesn't exist, say in the United States, where there's very little compliance around carbon emissions from trucks, there's very little motivation unless there's a, a cost savings for using hydrogen instead of diesel or, or gasoline. So at this stage in time, it's just not possible to produce hydrogen at a level that's cheaper than diesel. And so in that regard, you're in a place there's not a intrinsic motivation um, unless there's a high moral ground, which is very difficult to get from a large company. So the, you, know, you really need a, a, an ecosystem of, of government assistance, compliance, carbon tax, um, and you need uh, forward-thinking companies who say, well, we want to be in the front end of, um, of, of reducing our contribution to climate change. So it requires a cluster. It re and, and so I've been working with bringing together multiple private companies together with governments, uh, governmental bodies, uh, together with 
associations and really trying to build a, a cluster where there is an actual viable industry. And in early industries, you know, certainly Elon Musk faced this with electrification of transport. He wouldn't be where he was without the U.S. government funding. Hey, just to follow up on that, I'm kind of curious on um, how do you get private sectors and public sectors, oh, mainly the, the policymakers, right? To, to collaborate, especially if there is a requirement for the public sector to invest first. Yeah, that, that's a great that a question. question. I find yeah. that it, it varies from country to country. Yeah, it varies from country to country. I was talking to someone in the Netherlands this morning uh, that they wanted to bring a truck fleet to uh, uh, adopt hydrogen. And I raised this question. I said, well, how, you know, given the fact that we can't compete with diesel, how are you going to um, um, implement this? He said, well, it's no problem. The government has told these companies that they have to reduce their carbon in the next three years, so they have to do it. So that's a completely different environment than and, and collaboration, if you want to call it that, or you could call it coercion, but it's kind of a, it, it's, it's a, it's a societal commitment. And as I've mentioned, uh, at, living in the U.S., I just feel like we're so far behind because there's no leverage. There's no carbon tax. There's no compliance. It's me going to a, a, a fleet of trucks and say, you know what? For the betterment of the world, we want you to pay $3 per kilogram for your fuel. Very difficult sell in an environment where they're being driven by financial margins. Yeah, I completely agree, especially when you throw in the political component. So from my experience, what we see is that from administration to administration, everybody has different platform. So some of my work right now in Salt Lake, what we're concerned about is the current mayor is very focused on life science as a platform to build the ecosystem. But, you know, if the next administration comes and changes their mind, what is all this collaboration and work and where would that actually lead? So this is why I'm curious. How, how did that's you get great, people to start talking? That's a great insight. Right. Um, and, and at this stage, actually, you know, in the sector of energy, um, at, at least there is a recognition that um, that that their economic infrastructure is going to be reinvented. Um, and the last administration, to be honest, had a lot of chatter about this, but they didn't put much actual effort into it, speaking about the Trump administration. We'll see what the Biden administration does. Will they pass this infrastructure package? And uh, the EU is already sold, committed. It doesn't matter what national government comes in Sweden or the Netherlands. The EU is already dedicated to the fact that we cannot continue to uh, emit carbons at the level that we are now. Uh, but So that's a cultural, not just a political environment. Mm -hmm. So let me let me weave in one of the questions from, from the audience and then go back to my, my prepared question. Um, uh, uh, Matthias asked the question, how do you conceive an ecosystem or perhaps what do you consider are the critical enablers of it? Um, I know... Uh, We've discussed kind of regulation. We've discussed economic incentives. Uh, other, are there other ones? Maybe uh, I'll, I'll go to you, Jordi, first. But uh, other ones that come to mind where you can do it, like there, there, there must be areas where you can or organically kind of grow certain clusters. And what would be an, an, an enabler of that beyond those two uh, primary factors, which involve government? Well, there's, uh, there's uh, definitely uh, uh, the regulatory and uh, the economic incentive. It's one of the drivers uh, in order to build a long-term and consistent ecosystem in any region or uh, in any industry focus. Um, if we take the example of Europe, uh, I would say moving from, from a, a fragmented territory into an European uh, Union, We've learned a lot on uh, sharing uh, uh, and, uh, and trying to find the best regions uh, where uh, accommodate uh, uh, a cluster which might be more relevant for the region itself and uh, really find uh, uh, efficiency among different regions within the territory. And uh, this has been uh, a, a big effort uh, from the political uh, um, uh, point of view, still ongoing. Uh, you know, it's a, a very early stage process for the European Union uh, how to um, foster uh, ecosystems and uh, and cluster organizations around uh, 
the whole uh, uh, territory, even now looking on, uh, on the Brexit and uh, some uh, regions which are not great believers on, on the final outcome. So uh, I would say uh, there's a lot uh, that has to do with the private sector in this case, right? And uh, it should be something that should be uh, uh, leveraged on both sides. Uh, there's a lot of uh, traditional knowledge and traditional areas where uh, there is a lot of expertise and, and, and local uh, uh, um, know-how that needs to be connected with uh, other regions within, the, within Europe. So uh, it's always about uh, finding uh, the uh, purpose, as I uh, said at the beginning of, of this uh, conversation, about uh, finding uh, a, a purpose that uh, really re aims at returning uh, benefits for, for the society as a whole and not only for, for the shareholders. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's one of the main uh, challenges, uh, find this, this purpose uh, in order to build a consistent uh, community uh, and a con uh, consistent innovation ecosystem around around it. Yeah. So if we look into energy, uh, it could be quite clear uh, that uh, there's a purpose uh, on, uh, on, on fighting against the climate change. If we look into the uh, healthcare industry and life science, maybe with the COVID-19 we would find a common purpose uh, to develop a community of uh, innovators around this topic. So at the end, uh, it's something that we need to uh, define uh, and uh, to bet for it. And as uh, Anne said, I think uh, we cannot change this every four years, every mandate. Uh, it needs to be something consistent and uh, for the long term. Okay. Any uh, any additional comments to what, what Jordi added here? I'll... I'll uh... I'll, I'll volunteer a couple of um, uh, areas where you know, I've been involved where I did not think you could get the kind of a, a lot of help from the government or from, from the laws um, and kind of starting an, uh, a technology startup hub uh, in, in a country like Jordan addressing the, the region by, back in uh, 2010. Uh, we did it completely with private sector. Uh, there, there was some, some help. From, from some of the public, but mostly it was private sector driven, and it had to do with explaining the benefits to the to the private sector, and showing them that actually they can make uh, uh, make money. Certainly, when I was at Barclays, uh, there was a strong interest in kind of understanding fintech and getting the uh, uh, workforce uh, exposed to what's happening in the fintech space, and this is why Barclays created the. Barclays Accelerator at first in London and then in, in many other cities around the UK and, and the US. Uh, so it, it is, I think it is possible to do it uh, with, with private and not necessarily government intervention, although uh, the proper government intervention can be a huge accelerator if it's done right. Um, yeah, I would say, Osama, that um, you, you know, I, I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, the contribution of private sector innovation. Um, and, you know, if we wait for government to solve, our, solve all of our problems, then I think we're in really deep trouble. Um, I, I think, though, that government can recognize opportunity and they can recognize momentum. They can recognize economic uh, uh, migration, uh, where investments moving in a certain direction. Um, I, so, I, you know, I would say that, in, in a way, the pioneers of, say, electric cars and, the, and hydrogen, it, it wasn't coming from government. It was coming from private sector. And now... You know, the government's recognizing the value of this. Um, one of my companies, my hydrogen company, is located in Vancouver. It's called Hydro Energy. And the Br British Columbia government just required every utility to require 10% infusion of hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline because that will reduce the amount of carbon. Even 10% will reduce the amount of carbon. The utility would not have done that by itself. And, and, and certainly the government would not have done if there wasn't a innovation available that showed that there could be a reduction of carbon by infusing hydrogen. So I think it's an interplay between private sector innovation, private sector financing, and government regulation, and even government subsidies. Yeah, and just to add to that too, um, I think it needs to be beyond just investment, right? Um, if like, for an example, if you don't engage the community, right, um, it's not going to be sustainable. So in an example, going back mm -hmm. into Salt Lake, and right now in Massachusetts, 
in order for us to maintain this ecosystem in life science, you know, there's a lot of efforts and grants being uh, put in place to ensure that we're, we're training students, right, early on in high school and in elementary school to get interested in STEM, for example, putting together internship programs to get students to stay around. So I think when you think through building a cluster, it needs to be beyond just writing a check or, or putting in, you know, you need to think more about the community holistically and how do we get people who don't usually participate to participate so they're, you know, they're, they're, there's a purpose to it, like what Matias uh, mentioned in the, in the chat. Okay. And, and on a good point, I'll just say on raises a good point about you know, every private sector, every private company should be thinking about how do we in, uh, proactively and intentionally develop those clusters that are going to position us for success. And it could be community groups, it could be uh, other companies that are competitors. So it's co-opetition. You're all working together to create a sector, or it could be. Um, government relations um, or government uh, either leaders or associations. So I, if you don't have that strategy as a company, then you, you probably are losing out on some assets. Great. So let me let me ask uh, an, another question here, and then I'm going to turn to like specific questions. But this question is to all of you. Um, look, there's many uh, attempts to create clusters, uh, and many of them have failed historically. Um, and there's many reasons why these things fail, but what I would love to hear from you very briefly, each of you, is what do you consider the, the biggest reason why uh, a cluster attempt would fail? So maybe we'll start uh, with, with you, uh, Jordi, and then Ann, and then David. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, to uh, touch base on what uh, Ann recently said is about the purpose, right? So in many uh, circumstances, clusters are built around the, the idea to uh, enhance or foster some development around an area or a topic uh, by using or focusing more on the, the um, uh, public uh, uh, sector and using resources from the public, sec public sector instead of uh, building something uh, more consistent on the, on the private sector. and. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the purpose and, and, and the lack of a strategy in many cases is what really uh, um, prevents uh, a cluster to really succeed. Uh, succeed. Uh, I think uh, even f for the definition of the cluster itself, we should be able to find uh, another way to define it or at least to agree on, uh, on a way to define what a cluster should be and how a cluster should be managed, right? Because it looks like a having a cluster is something like a, an intangible asset, right? Uh, that cannot really create value per se, uh, but uh, it should be acting as a, as a, as a, as an enabler uh, for a, a, a technical innovation development or economic development. So I think maybe uh, this is uh, one of the main reasons why clusters uh, do not succeed because they lack of a strategy and, and purpose at the end. Okay. Uh, Anne? Yeah, I mean, for me, that it comes down to the definition of clusters. So it, from my perspective, a cluster is a community of stakeholders that come together and leverage them, you know, um, those resources um, as a whole. So sites that I've seen that I wouldn't say fail, but hasn't been as successful would be um, locations where they're not very focused on what they're doing or are having such a raw definition um, that doesn't leverage the skill set that is within that um, ecosystem. So for an example, um, a, a great success would be Boulder, Colorado, where they focus on agriculture, right, um, technology. So if they brought in that to animal health, it gets so broad that we sort, there's not enough of human capital, capital or right, um, to disseminate that plan. So for me, it's mainly been organizations or groups that haven't clearly identified what their focus um, will be and how they would deploy oh, yeah, their focus, limited resources. Focus is a big deal. David, short answer from you, and then I'm going to turn to some other questions. Yeah, I think, I think Jordy touched on it's aligning interests, having a strategy that aligns your interests. Um, and in a more pragmatic sense is a legal agreement get in the way of making, an, a, 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 between private companies, always gets in the way of actually making something happen. There's always someone who can tell you what could go wrong, what IP you could lose, 
what kind of you know a, a poor business structure. And so instead of looking at the opportunity cost of missing out on collaboration and acceleration, they focus so much on what they might lose rather than what they might gain. And here's a here's a question uh, that's uh, relevant in the uh, especially after the the age of COVID. Um, how critical is geographic co-location? Maybe I'll start with you, David, because you know you're, you're trying to <laughs> emerge these clusters in, in an area that's uh, you know notoriously probably distributed uh, geographically, and you don't have one place where all these players are together. Uh, is is geographic co-location uh, uh, a necessary condition? And then, of course, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Jordi and Anne. Starting with you, David. In my experience, not at all. Yeah, in my experience, not at all. I I, uh, I do believe that there is extreme value of creating trust by being in a, a place with someone, sitting together with someone, and uh, creating a, 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 a base of your relationship. But in terms of moving forward um, and being able to collaborate, um, I, I find that we are able to do it quite successfully um, just using, you know, whatever uh, technology available to us, Zoom, whatever. So I, I have not found a product. I would say my firm's most successful year was the last the year and a half with COVID. I think we became more efficient rather than uh, more distant. Okay. Any other comments by, by others? What do you think? Yeah, I would say I would agree with uh, what uh, uh, David has mentioned. So uh, I think uh, distance or geographical location is not a, a barrier today. Uh, it's uh, more uh, the idea around the, the cluster itself. So f finding the, the purpose, the, the, uh, the common strategy. And I would reinforce on what David has said about uh, the, this uh, um, uh, way of thinking that uh, instead of uh, embracing or uh, celebrating something that you can achieve together, right? Uh, you are trying to protect yourself against others within the uh, cluster yeah. because this happened when uh, there is no clear uh, mission for the cluster uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, the enabler, I, I would say. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, there is no restriction in terms of, uh, of uh, the geographical uh, uh, distribution of the members. Okay. Uh, uh, Anna, anything from you? No, I, I completely agree. I think okay. during the pandemic, we've been very productive as a company because we're focused. However, I, I do miss that serendipitous running into um, other opportunities mm. when you're able to congregate in person. Yeah. Mm. So related to that question, I mean, you you are uh, trying to establish your startup in Salt Lake City and you are kind of leaving w one of the, you know, most recognized clusters in, in life sciences and biotech, Boston, to go to Salt Lake City. Um, any any comments there that, that would influence your uh, uh, thinking or, or how, how would you how would you maximize the chance of kind of uh, creating the right environment for your new startup? Yeah, so I wouldn't say I'm committed mm. to a full physical move just yet, but I am um, helping a company launch in Salt Lake. Um, there's definitely a clear um, difference in opportunity, right? In Boston, I can trip and fall and run into a VC, right? Um, in Salt Lake, uh, it's a little bit harder, and so the the culture for startup in Salt Lake is is different because of that. Because that community has learned how to bootstrap. So as far as far as capital efficient, um, the 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 Salt Lake entrepreneurs are amazing. They can bootstrap with very little. Um, so it's a very different community. The resources are a little bit more limited in Salt Lake, but I think with the help of the the mayor and trying to build that ecosystem, I'm hoping that will change. Um, last question maybe goes to you, Jordi, which is um, kind of the the view from Europe, right? In, in the U.S., we've had, you know, obviously the well-known example of Silicon Valley emerging and becoming definitely a cluster for for what we consider high tech and online. Uh, we have we have places like Boston. There's there's New York and there's other emerging areas. Uh, how would you assess the in the EU, I can't think of kind of major clusters that have emerged in certain areas. Is there a reason why? Like, for example, I can't say, well, there's a Silicon Valley of Europe. You know, where, where would it be? 
Yeah, well, there's, there's several regions in Europe uh, that are developing at this moment. Um, you can uh, think about uh, Berlin area, even uh, Barcelona, Paris, uh, big cities, uh, uh, locations where there's a big concentration of knowledge and expertise and uh, startups. But uh, it's definitely a developing process here in Europe. So we are trying to uh, better connect uh, knowledge and, and different ecosystems all around the territory by uh, basically launching these uh, 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 programs from offered by the European Commission, this new uh, Horizon Europe and, and other Marie Curie programs aimed at uh, fostering the uh, uh, movement of students among different countries within uh, the European region. So I think there is definitely no uh, Silicon Valley as such or Boston life science area as such in, in Europe yet. And I don't even think that would be something that we need. Uh, looking at uh, how easy it is uh, for uh, an European citizen to move uh, from one country to the other, and uh, the idea of uh, using digital uh, means in order to build uh, relationships, uh, networks, and uh, also trust uh, among different uh, stakeholders. So uh, if you ask me uh, about uh, how do I see it in terms of building uh, new ecosystems uh, by leveraging the uh, uh, real world, the face-to-face -face, uh, and uh, the, the geographical uh, location of, of uh, clusters with the digital, I would say that uh, they will develop in a kind of hybrid system where uh, all clusters would need to uh, leverage uh, the idea of uh, digitalizing part of the ecosystem and the, and the community uh, and foster this collaboration all along the journey, all during the year, uh, let's say, having meetings, events, face-to-face, uh, -face and, and fostering this type of relationships and trust, which are also very important. And something that is on your side, uh, um, uh, Usama, it's uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning technologies, data science. So having access to data, which is available from open source uh, databases all around the world. Uh, and uh, I think we do not need uh,